Hi folks, Rick Waddell here. I'm the Chief Investment Officer at RFG, coming to you with a little bit of a longer form market update. We kind of wanted to shoot a video given the volatility that happened in the third quarter uh, and try to explain a little bit what's going on, exactly why all that happened. Uh, use our fancy new interactive whiteboard in the process and just kind of give you guys a little bit of a roadmap of kind of where we're going from here. So. Uh, without further ado, in the third quarter, we saw this little lovely pattern. Uh, you know, the S&P uh, started July right around 3,800 and had about a 17.4% gain uh, during, really focused primarily during this period right around July 11th, running up until about August 11th. Um, so market, uh, you know, huge gains in stocks, uh, a very, very bullish signal. Um, and then right around August 11th, we turned around and we gave all of it back and more, uh, dropping by more than 15% down to about 36.50, which is right around the level that we're at today. Um, and obviously this didn't feel great. Uh, you know, it doesn't feel great to us. It obviously doesn't look great on statements, uh, you know, and, and I sympathize with it. We wanted to kind of explain why um, all of this happened, which is um, due to this kind of whipsaw in the data. This is a chart that shows you uh, the inflation, the month on month inflation rates. Uh, CPI that the Fed is looking at. Um, the blue bar uh, is a little bit more volatile. It includes food and energy. The red line um, does not include food and energy. And we were rolling along through April, May, and June around 0.6-0.7% month-on-month price gains. So every month that goes by, we've got about another half a percent higher prices in what we call core um, goods and services. Um, and then right around July uh, 11th, which is right around the time that bull market rally started, we saw a massive cooling off in inflation. So uh, the core reading dropped down to 0.3, uh, and uh, the uh, total reading, due to some weakness in some food and some gas prices, uh, basically dropped down to zero. Um, and there was jubilation uh, in the streets and in the markets because investors believed that uh, maybe inflation was behind us, uh, and maybe the Fed would be able to cut interest rates sooner or at least not have to raise as high as some people feared. Uh, maybe this was behind us and the Fed could move towards more of an accommodative stance. And indeed, that was um, what drove that 17% gain in the market over that 30-day period. Um, and then sadly, we got this. Uh, when we got the August reading, that core inflation number, which is what the Fed is most focused on, was right back up around that 0.6% line. Um, it's clear that inflation is not behind us. Uh, and subsequently, Powell came out and gave his speeches in which he said, you know, look, we're going to have to maintain interest rates higher than maybe we thought we were going to or higher than maybe some people thought we were going to. For longer, we're going to have to endure more pain because we're still seeing this sort of 0.6% inflation number um, that we've got to get rid of. Now, um, I just like to remind people that the Fed is data dependent. Uh, and what that means is, is that they tend to base whatever their policy decisions are um, on whatever the most recent data or series of data they have seen with respect to inflation or unemployment or anything else. And as an example of this, I would point everybody to the 2018-2019 market. Um, back around 2016, we were still coming out of the great financial crisis. Uh, the Fed was doing these little series of quarter basis, uh, quarter point hike raises. So every time they um, met, not every time they met, but most of the times they met, they were raising by one quarter of 1%, trying to get rates away from zero. The economy was growing at this point. Uh, the Fed felt like um, they could continue to raise. And they rose sort of all through 2017 and really through 2018. Um, and towards the end of 2018, um, the market got concerned that maybe the Fed was ra ra raising rates too fast, uh, starting to see some economic indicators of weakness, maybe some economic indicators that the economy was starting to slow. And there was this nervousness and this concern um, that maybe the Fed was going a little too quickly uh, in terms of trying to raise rates and maybe we're going to get, you know, a big problem. And that drove really this drop in the market. This is from September 30th of 2018 to December 24th of 2018. Uh, market drove, uh, dropped by about 20% during that time frame. 
Um, and it was really driven by this huge concern over the Fed tightening and maybe the market wasn't ready for it, et cetera. And Powell during this time period is saying, no, you know, we're confident that the economy can hold on uh, and was giving indications that they would continue to raise rates. Um, then when we actually got to the point where we started to see some falling leaves, as I'll call them, some weakness in the economic indicators, the Fed very quickly leveled off, said, nope, uh, we've risen rates, we've raised rates as far as they need to come. And in fact, uh, towards the end of 2019, actually started to become accommodative. They actually started to lower rates. As soon as this pivot happened, the market rose dramatically, uh, gaining 25% over the course of the next four months, okay? This same whipsaw is exactly what you saw in a microcosm in the third quarter. Looked like the data was getting favorable. Uh, Fed, uh, you know, anticipate, the stock market anticipates that the Fed's gonna be able to become more accommodative. It rises in response, and then the data actually doesn't Su suggests that we can be accommodated with fiscal policy, and so the market drops right back down as a result. This is the same pattern in reverse, um, and it indicates a couple of things. One, it indicates uh, just how difficult it is to time this sort of stuff because you don't know when the data is going to change, and also it indicates the volatility associated with how the market moves when it senses the, the, senses the Fed might be on the wrong side of tightening or, uh, or easing rates. Um, I would just note for everybody that's looking out there that there are what I'll call some falling leaves starting to develop uh, out there in the economy. We certainly haven't seen that in core inflation numbers quite yet. But I would just note that uh, you know, falling leaves, my analogy for green shoots, uh, green shoots, obviously the first signs of upsprings in a down economy, falling leaves being my little analogy for the first signs of downturns in what is a very strong economy. Um, you know, whether it's uh, used vehicle value index, which have dropped about 13% from their peak, uh, existing home sales median prices are down about 6% from their peak. Uh, in fact, Case Shiller came out this morning uh, with a 0.4% month-on-month decline in overall home prices. So it looks like home values are starting to turn a little bit. Not drastically, but once again, if we're moving down, not up, then that's good for inflation. Um, two more that I think are very interesting. One is, this is WTI crude. We peaked uh, crude oil. We peaked at about $120 a barrel. We're down now below 80 um, oil is really usually a great example of what's going on in terms of global demand or anticipated future global demand, and that's down 36% from its peak. Um, and then last but not least, this is the Shanghai Shipping Exchange Index. Um, if you look at that chart, uh, this just measures cargo volume and prices coming out of China to the rest of the world. Um, that kind of peaked in early January, and we're down 31% uh, year over year in terms of where, or sorry, since January, uh, in terms of where that shipping index is. This all indicates slowing economic activity. And slowing economic activity is going to eventually translate into inflation, uh, slowing inflation, but we haven't gotten there yet, as you can see by the unemployment rate. This is the trailing one-year unemployment rate. We're still at 3.6%, sorry, still at 3.6%, dropped down to 3.5% in June, maybe ticked up a little bit to 37 in, sorry, in July, uh, maybe ticked up a little bit to 37 in August, but still well below the sort of 4%, 4.5% number that the Fed is going to want to see and those inflation numbers that the Fed is going to want to see before they turn interest rates around. Now, once again, when the Fed does turn interest rates around, the market is going to be exceedingly volatile. They will react positively to this notion that the Fed is going to move in the right in the right direction as far as market con are concerned, uh, in the in an easing direction as far as interest rates go. And I just note that timing this will be exceedingly hard. Um, one of the reasons why we don't look to either get more super defensive or more super aggressive you know, on a month by month basis is, this is a 17% gain and a 15% move, down, move downside that all happened within a two month time span, right? 
Um, and by the way, if you were looking to be data dependent on this, you weren't necessarily wrong, right? If you were buying back in July based on you know, weaker inflation numbers, you weren't necessarily wrong to buy that if you're a market timer, but then you got it wrong when the data wasn't as consistent as we'd like it to be. So, you know, I don't think that this macro data is going to come as, you know, nobody's going to flip a switch and tell you, okay, this is over. It's probably going to take several months of positive data before you are, or, or lower inflation data, higher unemployment data, before the market's convinced that, yeah, this is behind us and interest rates are going to stay lower for longer. If you're caught on the wrong side of this trade by buying here and then having to sell down here because the market turned lower, um, you're going to have to ride this portion of the down twice in your portfolio, which is not generally something that you want to do. So once again, we always recommend that folks you know, not try and time this. Uh, you know, we will get out of it. Uh, but trying to time it, jump in, jump out, get more defensive, get less defensive, um, is really asking yourself to be exposed to these volatility curves that you don't really have to be exposed to. Um, so with that, I'd just like to end on the following. Um, you know, I get a lot of calls from clients. I get a lot of concerns from clients around, uh, you know, this time is different. Uh, this is the first time we've seen this much money in circulation. This is the first time we've seen inflation this high. This is the first time we've seen it combined with a war in Europe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I just like to note that, you know, it's never the same, but it's always the same, right? Every single time we go through a recession or one of these crises, you will always find the reason why this one is wildly different than the last one. And that's generally a good thing because generally it's the case that after the last one, we figure out why the last one happened and we put into place policies and procedures that help stop that from happening again, right? So, uh, you know, the equity market bubbles that occurred in 2001, unlikely to recur again. The banking crisis that occurred in 2008, once again, unlikely to reoccur again, or at least in the near term. Um, and this is just an article. There's a series of articles from time that go back over time and look at, you know, at different points. What was the media saying about how this is completely unprecedented? Where was the stock market? And, you know, what does that all mean? And I just pulled the one from 1992 because it was during the 91 recession. Um, and it's, you know, this quotes are just very um, foreign and scary and, and uh, powerful and kind of echo what we're seeing today. You know, if America's landscape seems suddenly alien and hostile to many citizens, there is good reason they've never seen anything like it. Nothing in memory has prepared for consumers for such turbulent change. Um, and then he even goes on further to say, even the economists don't have a name for the present condition, you know, though one has described it as suspended animation. You know, it's very, we're in unprecedented times, which by the way is the message that you want to use if you're looking to sell magazines. Um, if you're actually a market analyst, you would know that we go through these things with some regularity, months every six and a half, seven years in the modern era. And holding on to your securities values or your portfolio's values during that time is very important uh, because it basically ensures that you don't miss the upside on the other side or try and time the downside on the downside and wind up worse off than you necessarily had been. And by the way, I'd note that even though um, all of this uh, you know, gloom and doom, by the way, on September 28th of 1992, almost 30 years ago to the day, uh, was when they wrote this article or when this article appeared in Time. Um, and at that point, the S&P 500 uh, closed at 417 uh, versus the 3650 that we're at today. So certainly um, it would have been a mistake uh, to, uh, to declare um, that the U.S. economy was flawed and going nowhere back in 92. So anyway, with that, as always, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to myself or to your advisor. Um, as always, I hope you're having a great day, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you for tuning in. And if you're enjoying this content, please don't forget to subscribe and click the bell so you can keep up to date with everything new at RFG. If you want to learn more about who we are and what we do, please visit our website at rfgadvisory.com.